Uh, so we're talking to uh, Zach Bardos from uh, Berkeley. So one of the things that we've been talking about a lot in learning analytics and is getting more attention, not just in learning analytics, but in society broadly, is this idea of machine learning, which is obviously uh, a key area of research for you. So could you tell us a little bit about what kind of research are you doing? Uh, so I'm in the uh, uh, quantitative measurement and evaluation section of the Graduate School of Education at Berkeley and co-appointed in the School of Information. Um, and what the uh, QME group is mainly focused on uh, in Berkeley GSE is on measurement, uh, psychometrics and measurement. So uh, my key focus on, is on measuring learning uh, in digital learning environments. Um, and where machine learning comes into play there is uh, I use a, a, a cognitive model, it's also a machine learning model or a Bayesian network. Um, in order to uh, create a hypothesis about how students are learning uh, longitudinally. Um, and after creating that hypothesis uh, of the process that takes place at a certain abstraction level, uh, machine learning is then used uh, to learn the parameter values uh, that dictate the relationship between um, the past and the present in terms of the transfer of knowledge and the relationship between uh, an answer to a question and having the knowledge you need to answer future questions. So with that process, are there a set of tools that you're using that enable you to work on that research? Because you've already addressed a little bit of some of the research methods that you're using, but are there any kinds of technologies that you turn to in your work when you're tr dealing with that kind of student data? So, uh, you know, there's always the dirty job of pre-processing and scrubbing data, uh, and I've been pretty old school with my tools in that area. I've always used Perl. Uh, as a favorite pet language, but uh, that's quite antiquated now. All the new kids are using Python. Um, but in the more statistical area, <clears throat> what tools do I take off the shelf? Um, I've always gone to uh, MATLAB as the main statistical package and uh, a toolbox created by Kevin Murphy, who has a very nice book on machine learning uh, with probabilistic graphical models. And he has a toolbox called uh, BayesNet Toolkit. Um, and it's very good for teaching probabilistic graphical models. A lot of routines, very well documented. It aligns well with his book. It aligns well with an online tutorial on the topic. What kind of insights are you getting? I mean, are you advancing in your understanding of, of uh, the way in which learners are learning through the tools that you're working on? And if so, what kind of uh, insight is it giving you that helps to shape your teaching practices? So I can tell you from the intelligent tutoring systems research applying these models, um, which is where at least used to uh, learn mastery of skills is where they, they have a deep history of use in intelligent tutoring systems. Um, what we have, what I have been finding is that different students really do have differential rates of mastery. So um, if you, instead of saying there's one rate of learning per what you might call a skill, um, instead say, there's a student trait, which is a rate of learning, that interacts with that skills rate. Um, and when you hypothesize that, um, you find that you get much improved results. So it, it'll be interesting to see if, um, as a teacher, not just can we identify this, this rate of learning, um, assuming it's some kind of trait, but can we actually influence that rate of learning? Can we make students faster learners. So let's say I'm a teacher or I'm teaching a you know at a state university and what does the work that you're doing now at what point does that start to what can I do with it? I think right now a lot of the um, instructors who are teaching MOOCs or, or any instructor who's teaching um, enough students where they can't sit down one-on-one -on -one with the student and really get a feel for um, their learning character um, can benefit from these methods. So what these methods can do for uh, teachers who are in larger courses, they don't have to be a MOOC, they can even be large lectures where there's a lot of digital uh, traces left, um, is it can tell you, you know, what are the different clusters of students in terms of how fast they're learning different types of material, where are the big deficits in knowledge? Um, and, and that has been traditionally what these models have been used to convey. Uh, there's an opportunity to employ them on this larger scale with MOOCs now. Um, but there's another aspect which 
um, the research is just being done, which is one of my uh, foci, um, which is to not just uh, measure the knowledge as it exists in the student's mind, but to measure what they were doing that correlated with an increase in knowledge. So instead of just measuring the student, shift the focus to course facing. Can we measure the efficacy of a course by correlating increase in knowledge with what they were looking at, be it a video or be it an interaction with another student, um, a, a forum post, a social network activity, um, or wa watching a, um, a, a traditional video and conveying that information back to the instructor saying, hey, a lot of people viewed this video, um, but it didn't seem to help them with the homework. Um, and perhaps it's because the homework didn't include an item that tested what, uh, what you thought you t um, were teaching in the video, or maybe you just didn't teach what you intended to teach, or there was a distractor. So you could modify the video or you can modify the assessment. Great. Thanks very much. Sure.